because they dare to fight back, they knew that they're no longer safe because, God forbid, Jews resist to oppression and to violence. And the same night, my grandma told me that her father gave her a pair of earrings, silver earrings, and he told her, Sarah, take these pair of earrings and keep them safe. That's the only thing that you can take with you to Eretz Israel. The world has overlooked an important episode in modern history. The 800,000 Jews who left or were driven from their homes in the Middle East and North Africa in the mid-20th century. Welcome to the second season of The Forgotten Exodus, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. This series explores that pivotal moment in history and the little-known Jewish heritage of Iran and Arab nations as Jews around the world confront violent anti-Semitism and Israelis face daily attacks by terrorists on multiple fronts, our second season explores how Jews have lived throughout the region for generations, despite hardship, hostility, and hatred, then sought safety and new possibilities in their ancestral homeland. I'm your host, Manya Brashir Pashman. Join us as we explore untold family histories and personal stories of courage, perseverance, and resilience from this transformative period of history for the Jewish people and the Middle East. The world has ignored these voices. We will not. This is The Forgotten Exodus. Today's episode, Leaving Yemen. On the night of October 7th, while Hamas terrorists were still on their murderous rampage through Israel, 26-year-old Adiel Cohen was drafted to serve in a Reserve Artillery Corps unit and rocket division of the Israeli Defense Forces. He went directly to a base near one of Israel's borders to start working on his unit's vehicles and tools. But that's not the only battlefront on which Adiel has been serving. Adiel is a content creator on social media, creating Instagram posts and TikTok videos to counter the anti-Semitism and anti-Israel messages proliferating online. One way Adiel dispels some of these misconceptions is by sharing his own family's story. Adiel's grandparents on both sides were in that group of 800,000 Jews who fled Arab lands and started life anew in Israel. In 1950, they fled Yemen, making their way to Israel to help build a Jewish state. Today's special episode of The Forgotten Exodus presents an exclusive interview with Adiel, recorded in front of a live audience at the AJC Global Forum 2024 in Washington, D.C. Adiel, you heard stories from your softa Sara, who passed away only a few months ago. She was your paternal grandmother. Could you please share that side of your family's story in Yemen? Of course. So first of all, I want to thank you all for coming and listening to my story. It's my first time in this type of AJC event, especially on that scale. It's very exciting to me, and it's amazing to see this beautiful display of Jewish solidarity and strength. So I'm very, very honored to be here. Thank you. So the history of the Jewish community in Yemen dates back for as long as the Israelite kingdom existed. It dates back all the way to King Shlomo and the first temple when we had trade with the kingdom of Shva at the time that ruled Ethiopia and Yemen. And for my family, as far as we can tell, we go back all the way to that era. I do know that I have one ancestor somewhere along the line 15 generations ago from the Jewish community of Iraq that migrated into Yemen. But my ancestry, for the most part, is in Yemen, Yemenite Jewish. I did a DNA test. The results were nothing too revolutionary, aside from 1% Nigerian. But yeah, it just came out Yemenite Jewish. And they spent pretty much the entire diaspora in Yemen until 1950. And your grandfather was a jeweler, right? A silversmith? He was. So, fun fact, the work of silver and crafts made of silver was a profession only done by Jews in Yemen. So you can imagine how impactful it was for the economy in Yemen. And, you know, a lot of people say that Jews like control the economy and all these, you know, stereotypes that we know. In Yemen, we really drove a big part of the economy because of the professions that we did that were pretty much only Jews doing them. 
So he used to do silver work and jewelry. He did both the traditional Yemenite jewelry, which is made of thin silver wires, creating these beautiful patterns, and not just jewelry, but also yudaika, candlesticks, and all these ritual tools, like the can for the besamim, for the havdalah, beautiful, beautiful art passed from his father and then his father all the way thousands of years as far as we can tell. And nowadays, my uncle, my father's brother, is preserving this tradition. He has a gallery in Tzfat. If you're ever planning to go there, now it's not really a good time, but definitely hit me up and I'll send you his way. Very proud of that tradition, definitely. That's lovely. Were they city folk or did they live in a more agricultural area? They were fully city folks. They lived in Sana, the capital, both sides of my family. It's interesting. Not a lot of people know, but there's a lot of nuance in the Yemenite Jewish community. So Yemen is a pretty big country and pretty diverse. You've got mountains and green terraces and agriculture, but you also have very, very dry desert and you have port cities. So every Jewish community in Yemen was very unique in its culture, in its essence, in their professions. And in Sana specifically, they were more into spirituality and humanities. They were intellectuals and thinkers. A lot of philosophy, a lot of the Jewish philosophy and poetry in Yemen came from Sana. And this is where both sides of my family come from. Did they live in harmony with their neighbors in Sana for most of that time? Yeah, so the relations between Jews and Arabs in Yemen vary. It was a roller coaster for the most part of history, and it really depended on the king and the leadership at every single time. And there were times of great coexistence and flourishing and times where, you know, you could see Jewish poetry and literature and just like in Spain, like what we hear in Spain. But there were also times of great conflict and oppression and violence. One instance that I can point out to was in the 1600s, in 1679. It was an event called the Mauza Exile. Not a lot of people know about it, which is a shame because it is the single most traumatic event in the history of our community. Uh, it, It lasted one year. And during this year, the king decided that all the Jews in Yemen should be expelled to the desert And the desert in Yemen is very, very harsh. Wild animals, climate, lack of food, soil that cannot be cultivated. And of course, this also came with burning of books and literatures and archives. Yemenite Jews up until then kept archives of their family trees and scriptures and poetry. We don't have a lot of it left before the 1600s because of this event. Two-thirds of the community perished during that year. There was no one to fill the jobs that Jews used to do. And at some point, the king allowed Jews to come back to their homes and live in their own ghettos. That was from the 1600s till 1950 with Operation Magic Carpet. But in the more modern, in the more recent history, we can point out the 40s as an uptick in violence and anti-Semitism against Jews in Yemen. A lot of people think that What happened in Europe at the time did not really affect Jews in Arab countries, but it is completely the opposite. We had Nazi emissaries visiting some Arab countries and Jewish communities trying to inspect options to transfer Jews from the Middle East to concentration camps in Europe and even building and establishing concentration camps in the Middle East for Jews. The Mufti of Jerusalem at the time, Khaj Amin al-Husseini, was also very involved in trying to transfer the Jews of Yemen to concentration camps. It did not succeed. At the time, there was a pretty friendly king, but Nazi propaganda infiltrated every single society at the time in the Middle East. The Fahud in Iraq is a great example of that, right, of Nazi involvement in the Middle East. And the same thing happened in Yemen. And I can point out to one event that was kind of like the turning point, and then we can also continue to the story of my grandma's aliyah. There was a blood libel that was spread in Sana'a. Hundreds of Arabs who used to be neighbors just turned against their Jewish neighbors, started attacking them, looting their homes, raiding the Jewish quarter of Sana'a. 
So did the violence reach your family directly? My grandma's family, they used to live all in the same house. It was a big family. In Yemen, it was common that the entire family, the entire clan lives in the same house, especially if they're well off. And my family, Bo Hashem, they were pretty well off. They were jewelers and traders, and they had a big house with the entire family. And their neighbor came, broke into their house. All the grandchildren, including my grandma, had to hide in the pantries and in the closets. And their grandfather, Saba Avram, was there protecting the house. Their neighbor came, assaulted their grandfather, knocked him to the ground. And my grandma, when she told me this story, she told me that they were looking, they were peeking through the cracks of the door, and they saw what's going on. And when they saw the assault, they decided to storm out of the pantries and the closet with pans and pots and knives and attack the neighbor. And she tells me they chased him down the street. And this is how they saved their grandfather's lives. And this is a story over Shabbat dinner. It's crazy, crazy stories that we used to listen to. And how long after that incident did your family say, we have to leave? The same day. The same day, but because they dared to fight back, they knew that they're no longer safe because, God forbid, Jews resist to oppression and to violence. And the same night, my grandma told me that her father gave her a pair of earrings, silver earrings, and he told her, Sarah, take these pair of earrings and keep them safe. That's the only thing that you can take with you to Eretz Israel. And the same night, they were packing everything that they could, but not too much because they needed to walk by foot. They packed their stuff for the way, and with dawn, they set to the city of Aden. In Aden, there was a transit camp, Hashed, which all Yemenite Jews from all over Yemen fled to during this time. And from there, Operation Magic Carpet commenced. But the journey was incredibly hard. My grandma used to tell me that the entire world was in the 20th century and Yemen was still somewhere in the 18th century. No roads, camels, donkeys, sometimes jeeps. And she told us one story, which completely blew my mind. It was a few weeks before she passed away, about how she, at some point, they traveled night and day continuously. And at some point... Her donkey, with her sister and her little brother, baby brother, broke off from the caravan. The rest of the family, they had to stay somewhere, and they were held off, basically. But my safta continued with uh, their donkey, with her sister, Tsivia, and their baby brother, uh, one-year-old, Ratson. And, you know, along the way, they had to face bandits and gangs, and it was very, very tough. They had to pay ransom every few miles and at some point, when they broke off from the caravan, a bandit came and assaulted them. He pushed them off the cliffside and took the donkey with everything, everything they had, food, the equipment, they had nothing left. And they were left stranded on the cliffside. It was already starting to get dark, and they don't know where the rest of the family is, somewhere in the back, and they don't know if they can ever find them. And she told me that, it began to get darker and darker. And at some point they looked up and all they saw was pitch black and just night sky full of stars. And they were praying and they were singing, just hanging on a cliffside. Imagine that at the time she was 12, her sister was 14 and they were both holding a little one-year-old baby. And she said that when they stopped singing, kind of lost hope already, their brother started crying. And when he started crying, that's exactly when their family passed on the trail up on the mountain. And this is how they got rescued in the middle of the night, in the middle of the desert, after being attacked and robbed. And they had to just continue walking all the way to Camp Hashid. They spent a few months there as well. Not easy months. Your grandmother was one who believed in miracles, I believe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely. Yes. Well, instead of going into the details of Operation Magic Carpet or On Eagle's Wings was really the name of that operation, I encourage our audience to listen to the first season of The Forgotten Exodus, where we interviewed Israeli Olympian Shahar Zubari. 
His family also came from Yemen, and the details of Operation on Eagle's Wings, there are a lot of details about that in that episode, so I encourage you to, to go back and listen to that so that we can move on to your family's arrival in Israel, which also was not easy. Yeah, definitely not easy. I believe you've all heard of the conditions in the transit camps in Israel. My family arrived in the winter of 1950. It was considered probably the coldest winter recorded in Israel. So cold, it snowed in Tel Aviv. And that was the first time my grandma ever saw snow. They arrived at the transit camp in Ein Shemer, and they were one of the lucky families, I guess maybe because they were pretty well off. They didn't sleep in a tent, but they slept in a tin shack, a little tin shack. Not the best conditions, obviously. No heating, no beds, sleeping on the ground, the entire family, and, you know, passing the tough winter months, mud, rain, everything. And after a few months there, they were assigned a new place in Kadima, which is a small village in the Sharon in central Israel, agricultural community. And my family, who are all traders, jewelers, they don't know anything about farming. They lasted there for very, very little time. At some point, the head of the family, the grandfather said, we're out of here. And part of the family moved to Tel Aviv, to Kerem Atamanim, the Yemenite quarter, which is very, very dear to my heart. And the other half to Ramat Gan, my hometown, which is even more dear to me. This is where I was born and raised. My grandma met my grandfather there, and this is where they married. How did they plant roots in Israel? I mean, they left with hardly anything, except for a pair of, your grandmother had a pair of silver earrings in her possession. How did they start with nothing and build from there? What did they build? There was a lot of like hustling and like trying to make things work and moving from job to job until she got married and became a, how do you call it? Like a homemaker? Oh, or like housewife, homemaker, housewife, homemaker, mother. A housewife, yeah. She took care of the kids. And my grandfather, he did most of the work. He did, again, silversmith, some trading, a lot of hustle as well in, in between. They really just kind of made it work somehow. Also, they were organizing a lot of events in their homes, a lot of community events and parties for the community, for the neighborhood, which is also something that looking back now that, you know, I spoke to my parents about it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I grew up on these values of how important the community is and how important it is to be involved in the community. So it came from my grandparents. In addition to those values, what traditions have you been able to preserve that are very meaningful to you in terms of, when I say traditions, I mean, religious rituals, recipes, attire. Yeah, so if you mention attire, I have a very, very special item in my closet that I got from my grandfather, from Saba Pinchas. It is his original Yom Kippur gown for men. It's beautiful, white, long shirt with golden embroidery all the way from Yemen, and it still sits in my closet waiting for the right project to kind of show it off. I tried wearing it, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I uh, tried wearing it, it looks weird. It's very, very archaic, but it's beautiful nonetheless. And in terms of recipes, of course, my grandma used to make all the Yemenite Jewish food from Yemenite soup to all sorts of bread, which we're very famous for. People think that Yemenites only eat bread, but it's not true. But we do have a lot of types of bread. So every Friday growing up, I used to wake up and see a pile of zalabie, which is kind of like a fried pita, flatbread. Very amazing, like crunchy, but also soft. Every Friday morning, lachuch. All the recipes, and if you follow my Instagram and you see, sometimes when my grandma was alive, I used to post a lot of videos about her and about our traditions. She had her own recipe for charoset, for Pesach, in Yemenite Jewish dialect, we call it duke. It's kind of like the regular charoset that you know, only with a little bit of Yemenite spice mix. So it's very sweet, but also has a little like zing to it. Very, very good. If we're talking about Pesach, then 
I also made a video about that. The Yemenite seder is very, very unique in the sense that we don't have a plate. We don't have a seder plate. All the simanim and all the food is on the table as decorations. So we use the lettuce and radish and all the simanim as kind of like a frame for the table. It looks like a whole garden on the table. And we just eat from what we have on the table. And of course, the religious traditions, the way of pronouncing the Torah. I spent months before my bar mitzvah relearning Hebrew in the Yemenite dialect. It's like learning a whole new language, not to talk about the te'amim, the melody that you need to read. You need to be very, very punctuate. All of it. It's a huge part of my identity. You must have done a wonderful job because there's also a photograph of you and your safta at your bar mitzvah, and yeah. she looks quite pleased. So you must have done it. She fine was my job. best friend. Yes, <laughs> we we lived together in the same house in Israel. We kind of preserved the original way of living in Yemen. So we lived in the same house with my safta, and I was very lucky. Most of my grandparents, all of my grandparents, beside her, passed away when I was very young. But I was very lucky to live with her for as long as she lived, and hear all these stories every single week and. You know, even after I started my activism, she was my biggest supporter. I used to come back from trips to different Jewish communities and delegations and trips to Dubai and Morocco. And the first thing I did was knock on her door, sit with her for a good 20 minutes and just share my experiences. And she was so pleased. And if I can share one example, a year ago, I came, not a year ago, it was like this summer, I came back from a trip to Dubai where I met a Yemeni guy that took me to a Yemeni shop owned by actual Yemenis from Yemen with spices and honey from Yemen and jewelry and really everything from Yemen. And they offered me, when I told them the story of my family and I showed them pictures, they offered to give my grandma a gift. They told me, pick whatever you want from the jewelry section and it's a gift for your grandma. And when I came back from Dubai and I gave her that, her eyes were just lit and filled with tears because, you know, she hasn't been to Yemen where she was born ever since they left. So it was really one of the most touching moments before she passed away. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were very, very close. And I'm very, very lucky to be her grandson. What happened to the earrings wow. that her grandfather gave her? I wish we still had them. They sold them when they got to Israel to make a living. It was very, very tough, especially in the 50s. In Hebrew, we call it Kufat Atsena. All of Israel was basically a huge refugee camp, and the government had to make sure everyone has enough food and you know, supply and all of that. So they unfortunately sold it. I do love it when you share your family stories and your heritage on your social media channels and, you know, the videos of making haroset and the language, the sharing of the vocabulary words. I'm curious what kinds of reactions you get from your audience. Are they surprised to hear that you hailed from Yemen? You know, are they just surprised by your family's origins? So it's interesting to see the progression throughout the years. I started my activism and content creation in 2020. And when I just started talking about my Yemenite heritage, people were very surprised. People from, from our community, from Jewish communities around the world were surprised. I heard a lot of more surprised reactions. I think nowadays and in the past few years, there's a lot more awareness to different stories and different Jewish communities, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. So I'm happy to see that. And I see a lot of interest among Jews from other parts of the world People ask me all the time to share about my traditions, to share about, you know, how we celebrate that and how do we pronounce that and all of that. And from the non-Jewish audience, I'll start with reactions from the Arab world. I managed to forge a lot of amazing connections and friendships with Yemenis, Yemeni Muslims, based on our shared traditions and commonalities between our cultures, Yemeni Jewish cultures and Yemeni Muslim culture is a little bit different, even in terms of food, but there are some commonalities, of course. So it's very fun and fulfilling to be able to be a bridge between these communities who are alienated from Israel to Israel. We're sort of a bridge between our nations. For sure, there are also a lot of hateful comments that I receive 
from people telling me you're not really, the Zionists kidnapped you and you shouldn't be in Palestine, you should be in Yemen, come back to Yemen where you actually belong. They made sure that we can't come back to Yemen throughout these years and they showed us where we really belong. So, you know, there are these comments as well, but I can definitely say that the majority of the comments and reactions are very positive and people are thirsty for knowledge and for stories about different communities. I see it. I mean, everyone in this audience has a family story to share, has their own heritage. And I'm curious, Adiel, how does it serve the Jewish people to share our stories and where, where we all come from? Why is that so important to share, especially at a time like this, when there are so many false narratives out yeah. there? This is my favorite question, because telling stories is my whole shtick. This is my bottom line of every single you know, speaking engagements with students and stuff like that. Two things that make telling stories, telling our stories very important. First of all, is outside of the community. People don't know who Jewish people are. Non-Jews, they don't know who Jewish people are. I see it all the time. A lot of ignorance, which I don't blame them for, right? I don't know a lot about, you know, Uyghur people in China. And we can't expect people to stand up for us against anti-Semitism if they don't know who we are. And we can't expect them to know who we are if we're not there to tell our story. Because unfortunately, a lot of haters love to tell our story for us. It's kind of like a tactic for them. And the way they tell their story about us is completely different. And it serves a purpose that doesn't align with our purpose, to put it in good words. So that's one important thing. Telling our stories open up who we are to other audiences. When they get to know us, they can, more chances that they will stand up for us against anti-Semitism. And just in general, you know, just getting to know different communities and building bridges is always good. And the second important point of telling stories is within our community. I can for sure say that before I started my activism on social media and being more involved with other Jewish communities, I did not know much about Yiddish I did not know much about Ashkenazi culture or other cultures, even those we have in Israel. Because, you know, in Israel, we don't really talk about it. It's all on the surface level. You know, Yemenites eat Jachnon, Iraqis eat Kube. But once you get to know other Jewish communities and build bridges between these communities based on our stories, your individual Jewish identity and connection to the bigger Jewish collective would be stronger. I feel a lot more Jewish now that I know what Ashkenazim have gone through, what Ethiopian Jews have gone through, what Indian Jews have gone through, and all throughout the world. When we build these bridges between our communities, we bring our people and our nation to the next step in history. We've been in diaspora for 2,000 years, disconnected from each other, loosely connected, but generally disconnected. And now that we have Israel... And now that, you know, we have social media and that we are more connected and that we have this very strong compass that points at this one land, it's easier for us to build these bridges. And when we build them, we turn from a nation that is dispersed and made of disconnected communities to a network of communities that make a bigger, better, stronger nation together with our diversity, with our stories, with our different experiences. That's beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Yemenite Jews are just one of the many Jewish communities who in the last century left Arab countries to forge new lives for themselves and future generations. Join us next week as we share another untold story of the forgotten exodus. Many thanks to Adiel for joining us at AJC Global Forum 2024 and sharing his family's story in front of a live audience. Too many times during my reporting, I encountered children and grandchildren who didn't have the answers to my questions because they'd never asked. That's why one of the goals of this project is to encourage you to ask those questions. Find your stories. Atara Lakritz is our producer. TK Broderick is our sound engineer. Special thanks to John Schweitzer, Nicole Mazur, Sean Savage, and Madeline Stern, and so many of our colleagues, too many to name really, for making this series possible. You can subscribe to The Forgotten Exodus on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, 
And you can learn more at AJC.org slash The Forgotten Exodus. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. You can reach us at The Forgotten Exodus at AJC.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to spread the word and hop onto Apple Podcasts or Spotify to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us.